Good afternoon. This is Dyke Hendrickson, and we are the podcast Life Along the Merrimack. We talk about the health and history of the Merrimack River, and we've been doing this for more than a year. This is, I think, our 64th presentation. So the health of the river is much discussed because sometimes it's getting dirtier, not cleaner. But we also talk about the history, and here's a wonderful historical painting showing the river. This is by Richard Burke Jones. He's a city clerk of Newburyport, but obviously he's a wonderful artist. This is about 1852. Newburyport was a major shipbuilding center and a major center of trade. And here you can see how prosperous it was and also how large the ships were, that some of them are larger than buildings. So again, this is Richard Burke Jones did this painting and it shows you what Newburyport looked like in 1852. Here's another wonderful slide. I have just completed a book titled Merrimack, the Resilient River, and it's going to be out in March. I have about 75 photos, and this is one of them. And this shows how large the vessels were and also um, you know, what a big event it was to launch a ship. You can see a lot of people came out for it. There are women in the foreground, there are children over on the right, there's horse and buggies. This is about 1893. This is the Symington. This was the last tall ship that was built in Newburyport. One of the problems about the tall ship era, and Newburyport started building them in, say, 1750 and up until about 1893, is the ships got very large and heavy, as you can see. And the opening to the New Bayport Harbor is very shallow. It draws 12 to 16 feet, depending. So as the ships got larger, it got harder for them to get in and out of the harbor. And in this case, um, the Symington could get out, but if it had cargo, it could not get back in because it was too heavy and it would get caught on the sandbars. But this is the last tall ship built in Newburyport on the Merrimack River. One of the elements of shipbuilding, the ship life on the Merrimack, was people loved to go out on the water. And before people had cars, and certainly before they had their own boats, because that didn't come to the 20th century, people loved to go out and take a ride. Here is the Empire State. Um, over the years, Many different vessels uh, came to the Merrimack River. And here is one of the large ones. And you can see it had a big turnout. As I say, there are many, going to be many photos in my book. This is a wonderful uh, photo, bro, a fellow a photographer, Brian Eaton. He works for the Daily News here in town. And this shows one of the islands in the foreground of the Merrimack. And then, of course, in the background are several um, of the, not several, <laughs> scores of ships there and, and a, a steeple, just a wonderful photo. And one of my goals in writing the book, which is going to be titled Merrimack, the Resilient River, is just showing how beautiful the river is and it is worth saving. Newburyport is blessed with many parks. I think we have 15 to 18 parks. This is a Joppa Park created in about 1971 along the Merrimack River. Um, the bullards have been improved. Those are the hard, uh, vertical stone pieces you see to the left. And um, flowers have been planted in recent years, grass, and it's a wonderful park here in Newburyport. And the new Merrimack River is known for the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard started in Newburyport in 1790. And at this time, Alexander Hamilton went to George Washington, who was president, of course, and he said, we don't have any money. And this was about 1787 or so after the revolution was concluded. And Washington said, well, what do you suggest? And he said, I suggest some revenue cutters that can, small, quick vessels that can stop smuggling along the New England coast and they can go on, they can board uh, ships of commerce and make sure that the 
captains are paying the appropriate amount of tariff. So the revenue cutter service, uh, which they were thinking about, got started in 1790. That was the forerunner to what we know as the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard was not named as such until 1915, when the revenue cutter service merged with the life-saving service. And in 1939, those two emerged with the lighthouse service. So the Coast Guard started in 1790 as the revenue cutter service and in 1915 became the Coast Guard. I touch base with a lot of the communities on the Merrimack River. Here is Ben Butler's toothpick in Salisbury. You folks may have seen it. Uh, ben Butler was actually quite a major figure of his day. He was a general in the Civil War and was in charge of um, the New Orleans section in 1863. They hated him down there. I lived in New Orleans, that's why I know this. And then he came back and became governor of Massachusetts and lived in Newburyport for quite a while. So this is a nautical site and it's helpful for mariners when they're coming into the river and um, have a sense of where the Salisbury site is. Now this is an old photo Probably a lot of people have been to Salisbury Beach over the years. And this is a wonderful old postcard showing that it's been popular for many years. And Salisbury Beach is adjacent to the Merrimack River. And here's a shot of how beautiful it is in the wintertime. Here's one of our, <coughs> excuse me, newest additions to the riverfront area. It's the uh, Whittier Bridge, it costs 290 Two million dollars was finished several years ago, and there's the Merrimack River and the bridge between Newburyport and Amesbury. <clears throat> there are many beautiful spots along the river, and this is one of them. Um, it's uh, just about up near Merrimack, Massachusetts, and Brian Eaton took this photo also. Uh, last summer, a group of river activists and elected officials uh, took a 117 mile kayak trip from Franklin, New Hampshire to Newburyport. They were called the Voyagers. And one of their goals, uh, Jim Kelcourse, the state rep, went, uh, State Senator Diana DiZaglio went, um, Newburyport Mayor Donna Holiday went for several legs of the trip. One of their points was to, you know, show people and to, reinforce the fact that the river is still beautiful. Now we read stories frequently in the press or online about the challenges it has with pollution, but you can see here, there are beautiful parts of the river. And here's a wonderful shot from Amesbury. It's in front of Lowell's boat yard and uh, you can just see what a pretty sight it is. And there's Amesbury Church is in the background and uh, a wonderful shot. And here is um, John Greenleaf Witter. He wrote a very long poem titled The Merrimack. I plan to have it in my book. It's an ode to the river. Now, you know, if you're wondering, that little halftone designation at the bottom, I've got to make sure that's clipped away from the photo. But this is John Greenleaf Whittier, a very nationally prominent poet from the Haverhill. Amesbury area in the mid 19th century. The Native Americans lived here for centuries, of course. And I took this photo in Concord, New Hampshire. And in a short period of time, it kind of tells you what happened to the Native Americans. They were here, they were thriving. They spent much time in the Merrimack watershed, um, but through a variety of unfortunate developments, including uh, disease such as smallpox, um, a lot of them either left or died away. But this is a sign in Concord, New Hampshire, uh, representing the fact that they were, you know, for many centuries, uh, the key, out, key inhabitants of the Merrimack Valley. And as we say, it's a beautiful river. Here's a town line, Amesbury and Merrimack. Merrimack is spelled with a C, the town. Merrimack, the river is spelled with a K. It went back and forth for many years, but in 1914, a bunch of local politicians went to the state house and said, 
you know, let's make this consistent. Let's put a K on it. So Merrimack, the river now has a K. <clears throat> Many communities um, were involved in the mill work in the old days, uh, and that died out about a century ago, and they are rebuilding. This is a shot of Haverhill, and you can see they're using the river as a centerpiece for their economic development. Um, one, one shot here is a branch of the University of Massachusetts at Lowell, another is a bank, another is a housing project. So uh, Haverhill is making a comeback. Here's another um, area that you can see the UMass Lowell sign is there. Several other um, elements have moved into Haverhill, but you can see there's an old bridge, but a lot of new buildings. So Haverhill's making a comeback. This was taken in Haverhill. Uh, this is a Clean River project, a fellow named Rocky Morrison, who is in the stern of this watercraft. They go along the river and they pick up debris and there can be a lot of debris, tires and bicycles and, you know, carts from shores or whatever. And they really do a good job. They're not part of any government. Um, and so he has to go to each local government or try to get grants, but he and his team have been very valuable in picking debris out. And uh, I must say for a while, uh, they were picking a lot of, um, drug paraphernalia out of the river, but uh, I think that stopped for now, but you know, they have actually pulled cars out of the river. Here's a shot of Hannah Dustin, who in 1697, and this does go back, she was, this is in Haverhill, it's probably the most prominent statue that I found. She was, and her two week old baby were kidnapped by Indians, Native Americans and taken up to um, Southern New Hampshire. Now Hannah here in this photo has a hatchet in her hand because after the Native Americans killed her little baby, she got very cranky and she got a hatchet and legend suggests that she killed about eight or 10 Native Americans who captured her. She got away, she came back south to the Haverhill area. But uh, you can see, <clears throat> that this was an event that has been recorded in history. And it supposedly is the first monument to a woman in the United States, certainly one of the first. Um, and 1697, the event took place. And I think this, this particular um, statue was raised a century later. Here's an old photo of Mills and, um, Lawrence, you can see they look quite dirty here. Um, the river looks dirty. Um, I'm using this photo just to point out that things have changed a lot. This mill buildings are still there, but they're a lot cleaner. I always remember that even though the mills were dirty and made things difficult for the river with a lot of pollution, it gave thousands of people jobs. They were coming from Europe. Jews from Russia, there were Armenians, there were Irish who were fleeing the famine, the potato famine. So in my view, the mills employed a great many people, they fouled the river, and later in life, they probably were difficult to work with. But you know, for a period of time in the 19th century, they provided a lot of jobs for Europeans who are fleeing for their lives. This is a wonderful shot. This is in Lawrence, Massachusetts. And, and it, you know, as we say, the river has many beautiful spots. There's a Lawrence boat club way off in the distance, um, but not everybody would kiss this was Lawrence, but I spent several days walking around Lawrence and I'm glad I got some photos that make it look like a, uh, show some of its beautiful areas. This is from Lowell, Massachusetts. Um, there's a wonderful, National Historic Museum in Lowell, built in 18, 1978. Paul Sangas, the senator at the time, was very helpful in getting that passed. And it gives a history of the mill system, of uh, the river itself. And before COVID, 
these were the kind of tours that you could take. And I hope um, they become available after uh, the COVID is gone. This is uh, one of the biggest things, of course, about the Merrimack River is the dams. The dams were created to harness the water and they would let the water go when they wanted to, to create hydropower. Hydropower is how the mills were run. The first mills were in Lowell and they started in 1823. This is Lawrence, which started in 1847. So here's one of the hundreds of mills or canals that are um, of uh, dams that are on the Merrimack River. I, I never knew there was so many, but there's scores and scores. Now, one reason for keeping the river clean, if not just for recreation, is water. Close to 500,000 people get their drinking water from the Merrimack. Yes, you know, it is scientifically purified, but um, I'm sure that <clears throat> as a general rule, you'd want your water as clean as possible to start with. Now, I live in Newburyport. We get our water from the artichoke. We do not get it from the Merrimack River, but close to a half a million people do. And here's a, a shot showing you how, how large some of the mill buildings were. This is Lawrence, and this is the old and the new in a way. The mill buildings are very old, um, but there's a parking garage going there. And if you've been to Lawrence in recent months, you've seen their restaurants there. There's a, a lot of medical businesses in the old mills in Lawrence and they're being repurposed um, and it's becoming a vital community once again. This is one of my favorite characters. Her name is Helen Swallow Richards. She lived say from 1830 to 1891. And she was the scientist who brought clean drinking water to the Merrimack River. In about the 1890s, a lot of young people who lived near the river were getting typhoid. And even though state officials, you know, had a plan to chlorinate the water, clearly some of the drinking water um, was not clean and typhoid was frequent. She and several others down at MIT were recruited to come up and make a scientific presentation and do a better job with cleaning the water. Now, she was a woman for all seasons, I've got to tell you. There were a lot of men involved. She was the one woman that I saw her name. She was the first woman to graduate from MIT. She was the first woman to finish her graduate studies at MIT, but you know, this is 1876 or so. They did not give her the master's degree because they didn't give advanced degrees to women, but she was terrific. She's can, in addition to clean water, she was one of the national leaders in home economics. And by that means eating healthy, making sure the kitchen was clean, helping um, women and men uh, create budgets, not budgets, but menus. I mean, she was really incredible. She deserves a book herself, but I saw her name and I knew there were a lot of men involved, but I just wanted to get a woman out there. And if you're wondering what you're listening or watching, this is Life Along the Merrimack and I am Di Kendrickson. Here is something that came of her work. This is um, Mass DEP. This is where they test water. This is in Lawrence. Senator William Wall got the credit for it, as you can see, but um, her project in the 1890s was the one to clean the water and led to uh, clean drinking water, not just in the Merrimack, but in many communities across the country. Um, her work was recognized as the best in the field and many other cities started using her technology to clean their water. This is Lowell, Massachusetts, and you can see <laughs> how much activity, if I can call it, is going on. There are many canals and dams and waterfalls in Lowell um, because to start off with, they needed the hydropower for their mills. Uh, this is an example of some of the old, some of the old uh, dams and waterworks off to the right is um, a building of UMass Lowell. Uh, UMass Lowell has really taken advantage of the site that they're on, but this is 
a different look at the Merrimack River in Lowell. Lowell, of course, has many attributes to it and recreation is one. This is along the Merrimack River in Lowell. There's a jogger, there's some people fishing. Uh, there are a lot of people walking along. This goes several miles and it's probably, actually probably a mile. I wouldn't say several miles now that I think about it. It's probably similar to the uh, walkway in Newburyport. Um, people do a lot of things. And here's an example of how much recreation goes on there. And again, uh, this is showing Lowell. Um, there's a lot of hydropower still coming from the Merrimack River. And this is an example of damming the water until they need it. And they let it go and they use the hydropower to get energy for some plants from some electricity. And um, there are scores of plants across the 117 miles of the river that are still generating electricity for the Merrimack Valley. I didn't know that. Now here is a strong flood. This is 1936 in Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, that's the Amaskeag Manufacturing Company to the left. And it is having a very bad day, as you can see. It's an incredible, the, the flood of 1936 throughout New England, uh, from Maine to New Hampshire and in Massachusetts, really brought the river high and um, did a great deal of damage in Manchester in 1936. This is an example of Manchester today. Uh, the river is in the foreground, of course. And this is one community that has really made a comeback. To the right, you can see some of the old mill buildings and to the left are some of the modern um, motels, um, business offices, um, universities. And I would say that um, the Amiskeeg buildings have been repurposed for many things, including education, medical companies, technology companies, restaurants. So uh, Manchester is among the communities that has made a significant comeback. Now here, we spend a lot of time talking about dams, I must say, but that is, you know, what hydropower is about. This is a dam in Manchester. It is still providing electricity. I think you can see the, the toll, uh, the wires and the electrical uh, conveyors also. And so this is uh, another view of the Merrimack in Manchester. And this was in the spring, the river was high um, and you can see that there's a lot of activity going on. This again is the Merrimack in Manchester. And again, Manchester, New Hampshire, above the dam. Um, and I should point out that I'm hoping these people keep their power underway because um, no one wants to go over that dam. This is one of my favorite shots. And again, if you're just coming in, I've just written a book, Merrimack, the Resilient River. It's, um, and I have scores of photos. This is where the Merrimack River and the Nashua River come together in Nashua, New Hampshire. And again, it's such a bucolic site. The river's very beautiful. Um, and this is Nashua, New Hampshire. The river starts in Franklin, New Hampshire. Uh, this is the Winnipesaukee River Trail parking. And uh, this is, the start of the river. I must say it's where the Pen Penacowiski River and the Winnipesaukee River come together. They don't have one place though that um, is marked as the river starts here. So I had to keep walking. I walked around the back of the high school and eventually um, I saw where they say it is, but there's no one spot where the Merrimack begins, or at least one spot that's recognized. This also is the Merrimack in Franklin, New Hampshire. And I believe this is the area where the Merrimack begins, but there's no sign, so take my word for it. Again, here's how beautiful the river can still be. Um, there's residue there though, and, and I think we all know there's still pollution and effluent going into the Merrimack River. This is Methuen, Massachusetts, uh, all rivers, um, are beautiful and all communities have beautiful spots. Um, Methuen has this wonderful boat launch 
Um, and I can see some people here using the boats and having a nice day in the Merrimack. Here's a, the old clock in Lawrence. This was once the second largest clock in the world next to Big Ben in London. And it represents um, a time when, you know, century and a half ago, 1850 to 1900, most people didn't have watches and they would look at the clock to see what time it was and what time the shift was about to start. And so that remains one of the beautiful spots uh, of the Merrimack River. Here's another shot from Lawrence. And I took this one just to show that wildlife can grow in Lawrence. Here's a Canada, one species of Canada geese, uh, Canada goose perhaps, there's some have his friends behind him. But this is a boat launch in uh, Lawrence. It's not used now because of the COVID, but there are beautiful spots in Lawrence such as this. This is, um, in recent years, recreation has become a big thing in Newburyport. It always has been, but now close to 1,500 boats are tied up on the Merrimack River in Newburyport and more in Salisbury and Amesbury, but this is right near Cashman Park. Beyond it is the marsh, 25,000 acres of marsh. It's the largest marsh in New England and is really valuable for the wildlife, birds, fish, um, and many things. I, I love this photo because the marsh is a very valuable asset. Now, when we talk about how the river got clean, and how other rivers got clean, we must go back to 1972. And I wasn't aware of this, but the river got clean because of strong advocates like Ed Muskie of Maine. His wife, Jane, is right off of his shoulder, off to the left there. And he worked very hard for clean rivers. And the Clean Water Act of 1972 set aside billions of dollars of grant money, not loans, grant money. So the communities up and down, Haverhill, Lawrence, Lowell, so they could get sewage treatment plants put in and they could get a real start on clean water. He was so valuable. And you know, you see one manifestation of the beauty of the river. This is a wonderful shot by Dan Grabick. He is the chair of the Merrimack Watershed Council, but isn't this a beautiful river? And I think those who have been down at sunset <laughs> have seen some of the most beautiful sunsets here. And I'm going to finish with this for today. I'm going to, I have more photos, but this shows the Merrimack River entrance. And number one, I like it because it shows that sandbar off to the right of the river itself. And Many newcomers to Newburyport get caught on the sandbar. They don't realize it, it's there. It can shift from time to time, but uh, at low tide especially, it's very uh, shallow and scores of people, scores of boats get caught every year. You can see it's shallow. You can see it's narrow. You better take the north uh, entrance and exit on this one. And those are, jetties that were built in the past half dozen years. $10 million a piece was federal money. The feds did it to improve navigation to try to keep the silt out of the river. And so uh, this is just a wonderful shot of the Merrimack River. And I think it shows you uh, a lot about how difficult it can be to navigate, how beautiful it is, and um, how narrow. So this is life along the Merrimack. I am Dyke Hendrickson, the host. We're a weekly podcast. Thank you for joining us. Next week, we'll have slide Merrimack number three. I have about 30 more slides left because I've just written a book, and I look forward to sharing them with you. Thank you very much for being here, for participating in the Merrimack River, life along the Merrimack, and we will gather again next week or the next time you tune in. Thank you for being here.